It's 5.25. We'll begin exactly at 5.30. You, you, you may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? It's because I walk as if I have oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides. Just like hope springing high. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soul so cry? Does my sassiness upset you? <laughs> Don't take it so hard just cause I laugh As if I have gold mines digging in my own backyard You can shoot me with your words You can cut me with your lies You can kill me with your hatefulness But just like life All right Does my sexiness offend you? Oh. Does it come as a surprise that I dance? As if I have diamonds at the meeting of my thighs. Out of the huts of history's shame I ride. Up from a past rooted in pain I ride. A black ocean leaping and wild, welling and swelling and bearing in the top. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear I ride. Into a daybreak miraculously clear. I rise. 
bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the hope and the dream of the slave. All right. Hey there, everyone. It's 5.30 and uh, we've got 75 people in the house. Just give me another minute to let the people who are in, who are coming in and uh, I'll get started in another minute. Please be patient. I'm just letting a few more people in. All right, so there are still people sneaking in. We are 80 in the house and we have plenty of time today. And uh, as you all know, our agenda today is to uh, discuss how to write annotations as well as essays. Apart from that, I also wanted to elaborate a couple of uh, dramatic techniques, including kitchen sink drama. So we'll do that. And given the fact that there are still say 15 to 16 spots and people may be coming, Let's just begin the day because we have plenty of time by recapping what we dealt with yesterday. Uh, I'd like to share with you my screen and share with you a video on Beckett Ionesco and the theater of the episode. We'll watch that, come back and get started with the day. Hopefully by then the house would be full and I'll be free of any distractions. Hey there, I'm Mike Rignetta. This is Crash Course Theater, and today we'll be discussing the theater of the absurd. Good Goodell? That's your that's your cue. Goodell? Well, that's fine. Plenty of time to wait for that guy. Not a lot happens in these plays. Lights up uh, when you get around to it. <laughs> What is the theater of the absurd and how absurd is it? Well, I'm glad you asked. Very, sometimes. It's a movement that got going in the 1950s influenced by the events of the 40s. Because after you've come out of a world war in which millions of people were killed, maybe light comedy doesn't really do it for you anymore. The theater of the absurd wasn't one of those moments where everyone hung out in bars and had parties together. And maybe that's good because some of those parties would have been dour. No, it was more of a loose style that a bunch of playwrights started writing in pretty much independently. And then one day, critic Martin Eslin noticed and wrote an essay about it. And bam, a movement was born or identified or whatever. The theater of the absurd is another style that rejects realism. Absurdism, like Dadaism and surrealism, is predicated on the idea that life doesn't really make sense. So theater shouldn't make sense either. This isn't absurd like comedy in 2018. It's more of a deeply dissatisfied, questioning kind of absurd. Plots are disordered, nothing happens, or if stuff does happen, it's unmotivated. Words don't make meaning in the usual way, and characters aren't consistent. Mysteries don't get solved, and order doesn't get restored. 
lol. Philosophically, the worldview of the theater of the absurd is similar to existentialism, probably because Aslan was influenced by Albert Camus. In The Myth of Sisyphus, Camus wrote, a world that can be explained even with bad reasons is a familiar world. But on the other hand, in a universe suddenly divested of illusions and lights, man feels an alien, a stranger. His exile is without remedy since he is deprived of the memory of a lost home or the hope of a promised land. This divorce between man and his life, the actor and his setting, is properly the feeling of absurdity. The Myth of Sisyphus, by the way, is uh, an essay by Albert Camus. Uh, I had forgotten to mention that yesterday. And uh, in The Myth of Sisyphus, Albert Camus uh, discusses his concepts of existentialism. And for Malayali audience out there, it is uh, similar to the Naranatha Brandon myth that we have in Kerala. A guy who takes the stone to hilltop and uh, throws it down and uh, rejoices in it. You may go back and Google it for further details. Lol. Aslan thought that the theater of the absurd could help its audience to accept life as meaningless and maybe not be so depressed about that. He wrote, it is a challenge to accept the human condition as it is in all its mystery and absurdity and to bear it with dignity nobly, responsibly, precisely because there are no easy solutions to the mysteries of existence, because ultimately man is alone in a meaningless world. The shedding of easy solutions, of comforting illusions may be painful, but it leaves behind it a sense of freedom and relief. And that is why, in the last resort, the theater of the absurd does not provoke tears of despair, but the laughter of liberation. Lol. There are a lot of playwrights who get labeled absurdist, including Alfred Jarry, Guillaume Apollinaire, and also the Italian playwright Luigi Pirandello, king of the it happened like this, no, it happened like that, nope, I'm never going to understand this because the world is fundamentally unknowable play. We're going to look at three other absurdist playwrights today, Jean Genet, Eugene Ionesco, and Samuel Beckett. Jean Genet was born in France in 1910 and was abandoned soon after. As a kid, he tried to run away a lot and he often stole. When he was 15, he was sent to French juvie. When he turned 18, he joined the French Foreign Legion, but was drummed out for being gay. He wandered around for a while, supporting himself with prostitution and petty theft. He was in and out of prison, and it was in prison that he began to write, completing an experimental novel, Our Lady of the Flowers, in 1944. Genet became popular with the French intellectual crowd, so when he was threatened with life imprisonment in 1949 for more theft, those intellectuals came together to petition the government to free him. And the government said, okay. Philosopher and playwright Jean-Paul Sartre was such a fan that he wrote a 700-page analysis of his life and work called Saint Genet. When Genet turned to the theater, first with the short play Death Watch, he established the themes that would fascinate him for years. Sex, power, beauty, degradation, ritual, and theatricality itself. Most of the characters in Genet's plays are consciously playing roles that can suddenly be reversed. And with a shift in power dynamics comes a shift in sexual dynamics. Reality often shifts too, which gives the plays a disturbing, decentering quality. You can see this in The Balcony, which is set in a brothel that caters to sexual role play, and in The Blacks, in which a cast of black actors perform in whiteface. Genet died in Paris in 1986. Let's take a closer look at Genet's work by dusting off his three-character 1947 drama, The Maids. Grab a mop, thought bubble. The Maids begins with a scene between a mistress and her maid, Claire. The relationship isn't great. Madame insults Claire, and Claire bullies Madame, forcing her to wear a red dress. Claire spits at her. Then, an alarm goes off, startling both women. We realize that Madame is actually the maid, Claire, and Claire is her sister, Solange, and that this is an elaborate psychosexual game they play, taking turns as Madame. As they wait for Madame, the phone rings. It's Monsieur, Madame's lover. He's been in prison, mostly because of an anonymous letter the maids sent. Now, he's out on bail. Bad news for the maids. They're afraid he'll recognize their handwriting. They're frightened, and also they're disgusted by their own poverty and servitude. As Solange says, I want to help you. I want to comfort you, but I know I disgust you. I'm repulsive to you. 
and I know it because you disgust me. When slaves love one another, it's not love. Claire replies, and me, I'm sick of seeing my image thrown back at me by a mirror, like a bad smell. You're my bad smell. So, out of revenge and disgust, and in a not very sane attempt at self-preservation, Claire decides to murder Madame. Madame returns, and Claire puts sleeping pills in her tea. But before she can drink it, Solange tells her that Monsieur is free, and Madame leaves the tea untouched. The maids begin their game again, but this time it's darker, crueler, and even weirder. Claire is playing Madame. She orders Solange to bring her a cup of tea. Claire lies down on Madame's bed and drinks the poisoned tea, killing herself. Thanks, Thought Bubble. That was not hygienic. While Genet based his play on an actual real-life French murder, Genet was obviously not trying to create true crime or realism. Genet's pal Sartre suggested that adolescent boys should play all of the roles as a way to enhance the unreality. But with its gowns, flowers, and sadomasochistic humiliation, it's already pretty unreal. Our next absurdist is Romanian playwright Eugene Ionesco, author of deceptively simple, sometimes allegorical works like The Chairs, or rhinoceros. Ionesco was born in Romania in 1909 and moved between Romania and France several times. When Ionesco was almost 40, he decided to learn English by memorizing simple sentences. Those sentences made their way into an absurdist and sometimes silly work called The Bald Soprano. In this play, one nice couple, the Smiths, invite over another nice couple, the Martins. The Martins think that they're strangers to each other and then discover that they've been married for years. Here's an excerpt. Mrs. Martin. Bizarre, Balzac, Bazooka, Mr. Martin, Bizarre, Beau Arts, Braziers, Mr. Smith, A-E-I-O-U, 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 I, Mrs. Smith, Choo-choo, 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 Choo-choo-choo. The director wasn't really sure how to stage it, and initially, the play was a flop, but other writers and intellectuals championed it, yay intellectuals, and Ionesco kept going. Ionesco was influenced by Dada and the Surrealists, and a lot of his work is about a desire to access some other, better, probably unreachable world. He's best known for a cycle of plays centered on a naive everyman figure called Béranger, who pops up in different times and situations. These plays are The Killer, Rhinoceros, Exit the King, and A Stroll in the Air. Some of these plays have a more political orientation, but some don't. Béranger is always struggling with the problem of human endeavor and free will in a seemingly random universe. Inesco's plays are written in simple, sometimes even simplistic language, but that disguises serious preoccupations and serious despair because, you know, randomness and entropy and death. Inesco died in France in 1994. And this here is your friend and mine, Samuel Beckett. Is Beckett the greatest modernist playwright? Yes. I'm sorry, it's just a fact. His plays are weird and funny and horrifying and deeply moving. Just when you think you've got one of his plays nailed, the meanings have a way of sliding out from under you. We're big fans. Beckett was born in Ireland in 1906. After university, he moved to France to teach, where he eventually became the research assistant of James Joyce. Beckett wrote poems, novels, and short stories, also all and he was at one point stabbed by a pimp. He also drove Andre the Giant to school on occasion. True story. During World War II, Beckett was active in the resistance, and after the war, he began his career as a playwright, typically writing in French. His best-known play is Waiting for Godot, a bleak tragicomedy from 1948 about two tramps waiting for a man who, spoiler alert, never arrives. One critic called it a play in which nothing happens twice. It's part vaudeville and part philosophy, and honestly, it's pretty awesome. I mean, it's made fun of as a quintessentially weird modern play for a lot of really good reasons but it is also just a good play. Other notable Beckett plays include Endgame, Happy Days, Crap's Last Tape, and Play, because uh, there were no titles left, I guess. Beckett's plays are almost completely empty of action. The characters are barely there. The dialogue goes in circles. Every rule Aristotle ever wrote, Beckett breaks, except for the unity of place. And as we know, Aristotle never even wrote that one. Are Beckett's plays realistic? Oh, no. So why are his plays so great? They're about people trying to live in a world that doesn't make any sense. And that's, I mean, that's most of us. They're bleak, but they're also very funny and perversely humane. Even in a senseless world, we still have each other. Beckett died in 1989 and well, nothing to be done. Am I? Me too. 
Not now, not now. There's work to be done. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time when we take a break from all of this existential despair and the search for meaning in a seemingly random universe. Grab your playbills and start stopping the stage door because Crash Course Theater is going to Broadway, baby. Wait, what? York says that existential despair is there too? Ugh, can't get away from it. Caftan curtsy, cup of noodles curtain. Crash Course Theater is produced in association All right, so good evening, everyone. Finally, I'm here again. MAG2, another session, and perhaps this is, well, uh, last session. So welcome back, everybody, and uh, thank you for your never-ending support during these 10 days. And this is the 10th day, the 20th, 19th and 20th session, and uh, I'm glad to see you all again and uh, close to a full house. We, ha we have close to 98 people in the house, including myself, Senator. It feels really great to get started with. Okay, so let's get started with first things first. Uh, let's get started with your annotations. I had asked you to attempt at least one annotation so that we can discuss how well uh, have you understood the concept of writing annotations. So I urge you, if you have typed it, please copy paste it in the chat box. Ideally have the lines in front of that answer as well. For example, if it's to be or not to be, put to be or not to be, put a colon and uh, copy paste the answers so that I could see. Uh, oh, Shaila Priya, spot on. Okay, others, please, please follow her suit. Do not compare each other for the time being. Just go on, close your eyes, copy paste and click enter. There's no need to feel ashamed or comparisons. And I think there is a word limit in um, Google Meet uh, for the chat. So when you post, make sure what gets cut, you repost it from there. For example, uh, in Shaila's case, it cuts after he has also married his mother even before. So maybe from even before, whatever is left, you can copy paste again. Okay, others? Yeah, I can see Akshay Ravi. Again, it cuts with FR, maybe. So you have to add a bit more Akshay. Uh, that's what Google Meet permits us to. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll do one thing. Okay, please hold on, guys. Uh, I actually forgot this limit that uh, Google Meets presents us with. So just give me a minute. I'll give you a wonderful platform to share your answers. Let's avoid the confusion. And uh, I'm really sorry that uh, we had a false start for the time being. Don't worry, just give me a minute. I'll share a link with you. All you need to do is copy paste your answers there so that we can avoid confusions and I can also read the entire answer rather than having jumbled answers. So, all right, just give me a second. I'm sharing a link with you. New document, just a second, annotations, just a second, annotations, and uh, let me change the default priorities for sharing. It's not restricted to people from Igmo. It is something that can be accessed and edited by anybody with the link. All right. So, all right. So, I'm sharing a link in the chat box. It's a Google Docs. Put one, two, three random numbers, put 55, whatever you want to for yourselves, and copy paste your answers. The link is there in the chat box. Try not to override anybody's answers. Don't rush. Be patient. Maybe enter and scroll downwards. And make sure your answer is posted completely and you're not overwriting anybody. The link is there in your chat box. I'll give you a couple of minutes to paste your answers. I'm having a look at that document.
I repeat, please copy paste your answers in that Google Docs, just like you did in the chat box a little while ago. Please give some fictitious numbering to your answers, like number 55, number 20, number 30, whatever, so that you don't mix up with someone else. You needn't put your name. That's totally okay. If you want, you can have your name. That's all right, too. But please hurry up a little. Guys, please be quick. It seems you guys are taking so much of time. I can only see close to four, three or four answers. I urge you to be quick. All right, Christina, the reason why I created that link is chat box has some limitations. Uh, maybe you have to 
copy paste twice or thrice from mid and all it gets cut in middle so that's why i gave you the other link but if there is no other choice you may try that i don't know if google docs really need another link i'm not sure about that but then yeah if you are not able to do that you may work on your own that's fine that's okay It's okay, no problem, Sriniti, and no problem, Sony. I understand you may have been busy with a lot of other works. It's natural, so no problem with that. I think the number that I can see in the sheet is somewhat sufficient enough for me to have an overview. That's all right. I just wanted to point out some common errors that you may end up making. So that's all that I intended to. So it's totally okay just in case you weren't able to do that. Perhaps a majority of the group haven't done that. That's okay, Gigi Mole or Lakshmi, no problem. You needn't be sorry about that. I totally understand that you might have been busy with something else. There's no need to apologize. That's okay. It happens. My only request is those who have prepared, please copy paste it. Otherwise, that's totally fine. No worries. All right, just one more minute for those who are trying to copy paste. Let's not prolong this any further. Just one more minute to copy paste and uh, let's continue from that. If you are having problems accessing it, Jennifer, Akshay and Christina, you may try copy pasting it in the chat box. That's okay. Uh, only thing is, that's okay. That's okay. Otherwise, it's totally fine. No problem. You can post that in the chat box, Jennifer. No problems. Thank you, Nirupam. Again, you Sir, have... Sir, uh, and answer uh, where you could tell you uh, send it to me. Okay. Everybody, I'm ready to learn. I'm ready to learn. I'm ready to learn. I'm ready to learn. निरुपमा योर आंसर इज हाफ ब्रोक सो ई थिंक यू नीड टू कॉपी पेस्ट फ्रॉम दैट पार्ट ही स्ट्रगलिंग विद फादर्स डेथ इज नीड from there on i think you need to copy paste again in the meanwhile it seems jennifer has left due to some network problem akshay you had initially posted but that's also only half the rest need to be posted it seems all right no problem so by the time you do that let me spend a couple of minutes sharing my screen and showing yeah again akshay ravi it is broken from you know uh, of the kings that from there on you need to copy paste again it's only half an answer okay doesn't matter that's because of the limitations in the chat box uh All right so I'm sharing my screen and I'm going to show you 
the file that I shared with you. Let's just quickly rush through that. So this is how some of your friends have answered. Let's not go on to name anybody, but then, yeah. Mm, yeah, somebody has to opted for to die to sleep from Hamlet. And as we the answer saying, this is written by Shakespeare in his work Hamlet. Here he speaks about suicide, but he feels da 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 da, da and uh, goes on to elaborate that. And Christina, somebody has answered your, or pasted your answer as well, to be or not to be. Just a second, there are people trying to log in. Okay, so yeah. Um, yeah, so Christina, to be or not to be, that is a question. She answers that these lines have been taken from Hamlet, the soliloquy, famous speech was spoken by Hamlet in Act 3, Scene 1. It is first necessary to define the nature of this action. In the speech, Hamlet contemplates dead and suicide, lamenting the pain, blah, blah, blah. And it uh, goes on and goes. Maybe Surya Kartika has done it for you. Thank you, Surya. And another person has probably attempted the section from Ben Johnson's The Alchemist. Just a second, guys. Uh, Sharin Saju, welcome. I have been denying you entry so far because you've been trying to enter at 6 o'clock, which I don't think is the time when our class begins. I had stated this clearly in the last class, and hence I was trying to deny you the entry, and you have been trying to log in time and again and again. Sharon? Okay, seems he's gone. All right. So, yeah, The Alchemist by Ben Johnson is something that someone has attempted. The Alchemist by Ben Johnson is evidently a satiric comedy. It can also be considered as an allegory. The characters in the story stand for a specific abstract idea. And the evidence of this is given in the prologue to the play. So here I assume that the answer is for these lines, maybe. These are the lines given for annotation, and uh, he or she has attempted to define this, probably. And uh, again, there are people who have done to be or not to be. You can see that there are three, four, five paragraphs or six paragraphs for that. Oh, my goodness. Then you have uh, lines from A Midsummer Night's Dream. Again, four paragraphs long. Then there is someone who is taken from Hamlet. The above lines have been taken from the drama Hamlet, which is written by William Shakespeare. Hamlet was wrote between Dash and Dash. The play tells the story of Prince Hamlet. Then there is another paragraph that goes on to it, action in action, religion, honor, revenge. Maybe that's a thematic definition, it seems. All right, doesn't matter. Another person has attempted the same, to be or not to be, that is a question, blah, blah, blah. Again, four to five paragraphs, and so on and on and on. And uh, if you look at the chat box, just a second. If you look at the chat box, uh, we can see that a few of them have attempted the same. Um, yeah, starting from Nirupama, who tries to do to be or not to be. These reflective lines are taken from the play Hamlet by William Shakespeare. These lines are taken from Act 3 and Scene 1 of the play. The lines are spoken by the Prince Hamlet. This is a soliloquy, a literary term for the lines spoken by a character to himself. These lines are spoken by Hamlet. Then blah, 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 the elaboration of the same. And uh, Akshay Ravi goes on to say this, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, a scene that I had uh, stressed on that day, frailty dining as women. So here in this line, we can see the young Hamlet who is shocked to see blah, 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 and the explanation goes on. And uh, there are lines from Macbeth, but of course, Arya Macbeth is not there for you to study this year. But nonetheless, I appreciate the attempt. So she says, Macbeth speaks these words after Lady Macbeth's death, and blah, blah, the explanation goes on. Srinidhi says, I want a little kindness taken from Pygmalion. The above annotation was given by Elisa Doolittle. Elisa Doolittle did not give the annotation. Those are her lines. And the annotation was given by the question paper setter from the play Pygmalion, written by Bernard Shaw. She says this to Henry Higgins, da, 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 and it goes for the explanation. And, uh, well, actually, Ravi's last paragraph goes like, we can see Hamlet's deep anger here. She did like this. 
she had been longing for this. This has brought more questions. Here, Shakespeare may try to convey the idea about, again, that's a break. And uh, Sri Devi has taken uh, something from Hamlet 2, and uh, Shakespeare has used this phrase in Act 1, Scene 3, line 78, 82 of his play, Hamlet. And the Polonius spoke these words as a token of advice to his son, blah, blah, blah. And he goes on to explain, elaborate that. And that's how it somewhat comes to an end. And uh, yes, Friday Menon concludes by saying, today critics believe that gaudy speeches of Polonius are actually Shakespeare's own maxims for living a good and noble life. Imagery and irony are the two literary devices employed here. Well, great. Good attempt, guys. Congratulations on your first attempt in this regard about how far it was correct or wrong. But then I'd like to brief you on how to approach uh, answers to an annotation. So to get started with, uh, when you get a few lines to annotate, do not begin by saying, say for example, these lines are from, the above lines are from, or this lines are spoken by blah, blah, blah. That's not the way you should start. Rather, you are expected to use indirect speech. And I'll tell you how. So the problem with most of the answers uh, that you have come up with is, most of you have begun answering, I'll again read those first sentences. This is written by Shakespeare in his work Hamlet. What is this? Again, these lines have been taken from Hamlet. And... Uh, um, there are people who have written, again, these lines are taken from Act 2, Scene 1 of Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, or uh, the above lines have been taken from Hamlet, or uh, there are also attempts like, this famous annotation is taken from Hamlet, etc., 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 and so on. So, uh, what you are expected to do is to put your answers into a sort of a reported speech rather than saying these lines, this line, etc. Moreover, you get annotations for five marks. From what I gather, you have to write four annotations, say out of six or eight given. And uh, each question carries five marks each. So how much would you write for five marks? How long would you write for five marks? Your essays are 20 mark long. So in that comparison, how much should you spend on writing your short notes or for that sake, annotations, which are barely five marks long? So what I tell my learners is that ideally an annotation should be not more than say three-fourths of a page, I mean an A4 size paper, or maximum of a page, and if at all you cannot complete it there, maybe three or four lines in the next page. Not more than that. I would say maximum one page. And just in case you are unable to conclude in a page, three or four more lines in the next page. Not five, six, seven pay paragraphs long, not two, three pages long. Maximum one page is the limit for an annotation. So what is the structure of an annotation? I would say an essay follows a three-part structure, though not a three-paragraph structure, don't get confused. But in a similar line, an annotation follows a three-part structure. What do you mean by a three-part structure? It means an annotation requires you to write, say, two to three paragraphs. Again, it's up to you. Whether you want that third paragraph distinctly or as part of the second is up to you. But ideally, two to three paragraphs is what is required from you. And the first paragraph, needless to say, you have done it the wrong way, but you have done it the right way. The first paragraph is identify the play, author, and the context. That is para one. 
para one may be say two to four sentences not longer than that so in those two to four sentences identify the play author and the context so for example if it's to be or not to be in that by using indirect it's in the indirect speech you can begin in a passive manner stating that hamlet is a play by william shakespeare one of the most uh, common attributes or attractions of the play is hamlet's soliloquies so in itramata soliloquy say for example the third soliloquy or fourth fourth soliloquy uh, in act 2 scene 3 hamlet contemplates suicide and wails that to be or not to be this is your first paragraph identify the author identify the play if you can just like sri devi menon did maybe most of you did because you were looking at the web sources or the text as well so it's easy to do it now for the exam to remember those would be difficult but just in case you can it's really good if you can say act 3 scene 2 for example lines 90 to 95 well and good nothing wrong in that but don't burn your heads too much on that at least get the act right you can even simply say uh, in act 3 hamlet contemplates suicide and as it is evident in the soliloquy to be or not to be yeah and uh, also if possible you can uh, try to uh, slightly speak about the para before or the later when you speak about the second para so the second para what a second para second para is basically the summary and analysis of the lines given if a single line is given then that means you are expected to know a little bit either of what precedes it or what follows it for example if it's to be or not to be you must be at least be able to remember that to be or not to be that is the question if not you won't remember whether it's nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortunes or to take arms against a sea of troubles i can say this by heart because i belong to a scheme where we had the annual scheme we 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 were fortunate to have classes every day and we learned all the soliloquies by heart for our exams and we also had annotations so even 10 years down the lane i can close my eyes and recite to be or not to be to you. but then yeah in your case maybe you won't be able to identify all those lines but at least if you can add the subsequent line and maybe speak about the context that was there before that then that helps so like i told you para 1 is about identify the play identify the author and identify the context paragraph 2 is about summary and analysis and in doing so it's also ideal if you can speak about if you can begin by saying what preceded the line and what follows that's part 2 so for example when i say to be or not to be you can begin para 2 by stating that after this particular scene hamlet was really confused he was contemplating a lot of things and he was not sure what needs to be done and uh, a confused hamlet speaks or contemplates suicide and he says to be or not to be that is the question just in case you don't remember whether it's nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows blah 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 all that you can do is at least uh, summarize that from their own he says that uh, this world is such a cruel world and uh, uh, it's better to die than to live in this world where we cannot trust anybody we cannot uh, you know lean on anybody and uh, there is a sea of troubles and uh, uh, young hamlet feels that he is too uh, incapable of waging a battle against that sea of troubles so you go on summarizing and analyzing that uh, soliloquy 
and uh, maybe after explaining those lines, you can even try an analysis saying that uh, at this part of the play, the character is going through an existential crisis. So he's contemplating suicide because he doesn't know what to do. For example, just like Abhimanyu in the Chakravyuha, Hamlet is confused about the way out. It's a heavier burden that he's carrying, blah, 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 whatever. And that forms your uh, second part of the uh, annotation. So I also talked about the third part. It can be third para, or it can also be the continuation of the, the second para. So what would that be? That would be a typical comment, observation. It could be um, about the style of the writer. It could be about the rhyme, meter, pattern, whatever. It could also be an analogy or comparison. It could also be, for instance, what may be called as rhyme meter pattern analogy comparison. It could also be, um, just a second. Critical comment observation about the style of the author, rhythm, writer, pattern, analogy, comparison. Um, yeah, I think this would do. So this, it, the last paragraph could be any of these. For example, by critical comment, I mean, uh, for example, if you are depending on a guide, like No Fear Shakespeare, or Cliff Notes, or Harold Bloom's Critical Edition, there might be stages where someone would have said, uh, E.W. Swinburne comments on Shakespeare's soliloquies that they are dash, dash, dash. So suppose you are, a, you are somebody who learns things by heart and you have learned this definition by heart. Maybe in the last paragraph, you can recode Swinburne and say that this is visible in the soliloquy, for instance. So that's what I meant by critical comments, comments made by critics. Uh, observation. Observation is something that you have. You can say that in his soliloquies, Hamlet seems to be quite disturbed. Uh, he uh, speaks to himself because he doesn't have anybody else to speak to or whatever you feel like. And uh, you can also speak about the style of the writer, rhyme meter pattern like uh, blank verse as perfected by Shakespeare. What role does it have in soliloquy? Does it, does it heighten the effect of soliloquy? and the impact, you can mark your comments, you can reserve your comments on those patterns. You can have an analogy or comparison. And uh, yeah, this is applicable to everything Satyendra. It's not about drama alone. Any annotation, even when you write an annotation in MEG1, the same applies. So in case of analogy and comparison, it can be intertextual or intratextual. For example, if you're answering Hamlet's soliloquy, you can compare that soliloquy with another soliloquy or all the other soliloquies of Hamlet. Or you can say that soliloquy was an integral part of Renaissance drama and people like Christopher Marlowe and Ben Johnson used it to greater effect, but then it achieves a special effect at the hands of William Shakespeare. So that at once becomes your critical observation and uh, uh, at, at the same time, it, it, it also becomes an analogy or comparison between fellow play, playwrights of Shakespeare. So that's possible. Or you can even speak about contemporaneity. Even that's fine. You can also speak about contemporaneity of the lines given. What is contemporaneity? For example, the relevance. For example, uh, if it was frailty, thy name is woman. After going on analyzing the lines, in the last paragraph, you can say that uh, post the 18th, 19th century, when feminism started to flourish as a domain, uh, several feminist critics have questioned Shakespeare based on these lines for his misogynist approach. Uh, the stereotypical notion that women are frail and uh, have uh, for, succumbed to uh, lustrous temptations have been maintained by androgynous writers, androgynous writers like Shakespeare, Sigmund Freud, D.H. Lawrence, and so on. So that becomes a wonderful conclusion for you if you write so. So uh, you can also speak about the contemporary relevance in that sense, or you can bring in theories to it. You're totally free to do that.
So uh, do not begin by saying these lines are sir. Put it in reported speech. I'd like to give a demo once again. Somebody has written well in terms of that alchemist. Uh, for example, if the lines given are, they shall find things they think or wish were done. They are so natural follies, but so soon as even the doers may see and yet not own. So the starting is good. The alchemist by Ben Johnson is evidently a satiric comedy. It can also be considered as an allegory. The characters in the story stand for a specific abstract idea, which the author wanted to bring to the notice of the audience. The evidence of this is given in the prologue to the play. So you can record that lines after saying that. And then move on to the second paragraph, where you go on to paraphrase these lines. Then maybe a couple of sentences in terms of assessing that lines. These lines depict uh, the typical Renaissance time during the Elizabethan period, the follies and feebles among the people. And uh, then you can somewhat conclude the second paragraph and then move on to the third paragraph where you would bring in whatever I have written there. Critical comments, observation about the style of the writer, rhyme meter pattern, analogy, comparison, contemporaneity, whatever you feel like. And uh, I think that's that somewhat sums up our discussion on annotation. And uh, it's not over. We still have maybe a couple of minutes or three or five or seven, if you still have doubts on how to write an annotation. I've tried to simplify it for you. Excuse me, sir. Okay, I'm sorry. I was I had to drop out due to some network issues. Uh, I rejoined immediately. So if you have any lack of clarity, despite my explanation, you may feel free to ask. We can spend three to five minutes discussing that. Excuse me, sir. Yes, Nirupam. Sir, in case I'm not able to remember the exact words that the critics use, can I summarize that also? I mean, critical uh, of analysis. Of course, of course, of course. So uh, th thank you. Thank you for pointing it out to me. I'd like to tell you one thing, guys. Um, even for MEG1, when you write uh, answers to poems, uh, one thing that you need to remember is it's possible that we may not remember all the lines. There are plenty of poems prescribed for study. So there is only one simple thing that you need to remember. If you know the lines, you put it in double quotes and write. For example, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot see the falconer, mere anarchy is loosened upon the world, blah, blah, blah. You put it in double quotes. You remember that. What if you don't remember that? Paraphrase that. And don't put it in quotes. When you paraphrase, when you're not sure about the lines, do not put it in quotes. Simply say, the poet says that, turning and turning in the gyre, the falcon cannot, or the bird can't hear uh, the bird, and uh, uh, there is anarchy all over the world, and uh, uh, things fall apart, and blah, blah, blah. So that's how you can paraphrase it. But again, I mean, I'm not trying to add the burden to you, but I'm just trying to tell you that there is definitely a difference in impact when you quote and when you unquote. If you, for example, for instance, if you remember the lines, put it in double quotes, it definitely creates an impression on the person who is evaluating the paper. Whereas when you paraphrase, it's okay. Like a person like me would understand because I'm someone who cannot always remember these lines. I end up paraphrasing. I'm someone who scored good marks without copying any lines on the paper because I don't remember that. I, will, or I think I've already told you phonetics and linguistics are two papers which I would do away with if given a choice. So yeah. So that's one thing that you need to have in mind. You can you know, uh, choose to not quote those lines. You can paraphrase it instead. But when you paraphrase, please don't put it in quotes unless you are sure about it. Yeah, so that's uh, the simple answer regarding that. And Nirupama, because uh, I could see you again today, uh, last two, three days I was asking for you by the end of our session, but it so happened that maybe you had logged out before that. Uh, because you keep asking for those resources, uh, I wanted to suggest the glossary to you as well. But I'll do that in a fag end of today. I have a lot of links for all of you, just in case you want to have an idea of uh, the critical terms, 
especially if you are from a non literature background like gigi molers for instance apa gigi mol ne ka pole ulla varku vendi oru vaada critical terms ne kurichittulla glossary glossary is not about mha brands there are plenty of editions including routledge cambridge oxford and so on so i have uh, quite a few links for you uh, up in the grabs towards the next session today okay so anybody else have any doubts regarding annotations or how to write annotations did i give you a clarity was it clear to you the three para yes, division and uh, in a way i'm uh, you know the thing is it's it's easy to score for annotations as long as you have good memory but apart from that the right style also helps you click so this is uh, one recognized pattern and i have been told as a student because i told you i belong to that old school of learning i i was part of the annual scheme and uh, we were in a way tormented by our teachers to write in a formal manner they would even cut marks for a spelling mistake or a punctuation error or not putting a punctuation mark for instance so i have been fortunate to be in those classes though at that time you would feel it like tormenting when i look back there were real lessons and they used to insist they used to tell us because this one mistake we also did these lines are from or the above lines are from the given lines are from they would put a red cut and uh, they would uh, reduce marks for us and they would tell us to put it in reported form and it's always better to identify the work the author and uh, in certain cases especially when you go to the second year if you can identify the genre it's even better for example the wasteland is a poem written by uh, t s eliot or the wasteland is a modernist poem written by t s eliot in the year 1922 it's okay if you if you don't remember the year that's still fine but at least the name of the work the genre and the name of the author also be wary of the definite article there are places which will have the there are, there will be places which won't have the yeah is it playboy of the western world or the playboy of the western world is it tempest or the tempest yeah is it alchemist or the alchemist so if it is alchemist don't write the alchemist or if it's the alchemist don't simply write alchemist and every year one complained or a, lit a literary joke that does the circles is that there are so many meg2 learners who end up answering the essay question on the alchemist and they end up writing paulo coelho's tale which has nothing to do with the johnsonian tale so be wary of that as well tanmi mahajan seems to have a question in the starting sir we have to directly mention the player rather than writing like these lines have been taken from the play yes tanvi you you are not supposed to say these lines are from or the above lines are from you should put it in reported speech like for instance hamlet is a play written by william shakespeare in hamlet in act 1 scene 2 in his soliloquy hamlet mutters in agony to be or not to be or for its sake frailty thy name is woman or blah 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 so that's the way in which you should write that is the the academic way of writing annotations or the standard way of writing annotations if you write these lines are taken from then if it's a treat if it's a no, generally your papers would be valued by valued by old hacks retired teachers would be valuing your papers so when they look at your answer papers they would put a red underline and they would reduce marks for that and i tell you not to write more than say one page because whatever you write you get say 3 and a half to 4 4 and a half marks and if you don't write well you get 2 and a half marks if you don't write you get 0 or 1 that's another thing but then yeah that's how it goes so don't go more than say a page that's the ideal thing any more questions regarding the annotation if you understood it i'm more than glad to know that but still there may be room for doubt if you have any queries i'm open hello sir uh in this critical appreciation what scheme is uh, resume uh, i didn't get your question satyendra what is it sir in any poem uh, critical appreciation 
what heading should be uh, used for to complete that no no you need not give any separate headings you just need to write three paragraphs or two paragraphs that would do you don't need to give any heading for annotation at least no headings whatsoever annotation is not an essay to give a heading no sir uh, i mean that uh, not explanation if uh, there uh, is a question about the critical appreciation of any poem then what to do uh, it, it is a uh, question uh, uh, 20 uh, 20 marks question oh okay okay satendra will come to that in the next session please be patient and uh, i think uh, well i'll try to answer that but then meg1 is not the paper that i'm dealing with i'll speak with reference to meg2 but okay i'll address your query as well how to critically evaluate a poem i'll come back to that don't worry for the Thank time you. being we are discussing annotation so if you have any queries if not we'll uh, wind up and move on to the next part don't worry sir we use yes, uh, um Present tense or past tense? Which will, uh, we can prove any tense for the annotation when we talk about these lines? How can you write say in present tense? So we always use the past tense. See, that's why I gave you an example: to be or not to be. For example, so I I'll begin by stating that uh, in Act One, Scene Two, uh, Hamlet was quite disturbed. by the occurrences or uh, maybe by seeing the ghost and the uh, responsibility that the ghost had invested him with and uh, uh, he contemplates suicide uh, in the scene and uh, hamlet is quite disturbed and he says to be or not to be that is the question he finds it really difficult to cope up with the problems that he is surrounded by being a youngster uh, he he is um, he is shocked by the sea of troubles that he is facing with yeah that's not past tense right we are using okay, the wrong okay. tense but then yeah it's, but it's more of a descriptive one sometimes uh, can we use present tense for example he says she says this to uh, he gains that uh, that moment like this uh, says is no he can't okay, say sorry. like so sorry, sorry i got your question let me put it this way traditionally or grammatically you are not supposed to mix between the tenses yeah you cannot say uh, i was going through uh, the road and i am coming near you and uh, i wish you will come to me some day these three tenses do not get well together so generally <coughs> when it comes to academic writing you do not mix between the tenses but then but then a lot of our learners especially the distant learners of ignu they have grammatical problems which people are also aware of but there is no need to panic you can work on your academic writing skills ideally you have to follow a particular tense whatever tense you are holding on to and uh, bettering that is up to you but as a as an evaluator if you ask me if you if you mix the tense and say somebody writes in a very chiseled form of english without mistakes i would give that person four and a half and i'd give you two and a half this is the only difference there so i would rather say if you stick to the format itself no matter what your grammaticality is you would somewhere get between two and a half and three and i speak to i speak this to you based on my own uh, what do you call testimonials i've been with igno for the last five years or so and mind you close to 10 batches i give them the same tips so after the exam they the students do call me or message me or mail me and uh, when the results come they do contact me so what they have told me is that they have received good marks probably because they followed what i said i'm not claiming that i'm right but maybe the results and their testimonials makes me believe that i am so i would say you work on your language but don't panic just because you have say a problem with your vocabulary or language skills or grammar something that couldn't be changed over say 25 30 years by a traditional school system do not expect it to change in 3 to 4 to 5 months beyond a the limit there might be subtle changes here and there but don't expect it to take a serious drag yeah okay thank you sir okay yes, i understood sir. 
one more question sir yes uh, neeru baba sir uh, i won't i am not able to use like you know very uh, refined language i my the language comes out to be very simple and does it make a difference if i don't write a flowery language especially in poetry uh, nirmama that's why i keep saying evaluation is always an individualistic process you know the way i look at a paper would be different from say someone else looking at the paper for example if you have been through the sessions of mag from rc kochin people like anita ma'am krishna aishwarya and i are handling the papers for you in terms of lectures suppose we get to value the papers the way i value a paper would definitely be different from the way aishwarya values the paper the same would be different when anita ma'am values the paper we may have our own approaches towards certain things so every time i would say to a certain extent paper valuation or the the ex, the marks from the written examination is always a case of uh, fortune though you can take care of certain things from your end and for example if i am evaluating your paper as long as there are points i will not really you know bother about whether you have written a flowery language or whether you write in simple language i can personally say that i don't give marks for those who simply go on jargonizing things there are people who have flowery language but if you look at the content there would be nothing i don't give marks for such people so it depends on an individual who is valuing the paper of course we'll have a key with which we'll be valuing these papers but nonetheless there is this aspect or dimension as well i would say stick on to your strengths whatever you are comfortable with get along that way because you cannot turn yourself overnight no matter how hard you try in 2 months 3 months you cannot completely change your writing style it has taken say 2 3 2 to 3 decades to get this far if it could be you know changed overnight then how many people would have become uh, emily dickinson virginia woolf and william shakespeare for its sake shakespeare wasn't even educated mind so just leave those fears aside whatever you have you have reached this far let's hope that it will take you further focus on the content focus on the subject focus on being aware of what is there as part of, as, far, as far as a work is concerned that's all that you need to know okay thank you sir okay thank you neeru uh let me share the link of the attendance sheet one last time and uh, i'll give you a few minutes to fill those sheets and then we'll resume with how to approach an essay question it's somewhat the same it won't take much time and then i'll also like to share a few links with you and uh, maybe we'll conclude after that okay with a q and a that is we'll have a larger extended open flow session too okay so the the link is there you may please go through that and uh, fill that nitya mohan is in an annotation is it required for us to write the back story that led to the to 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 those words should be stick to and nitya you if if you can well and good in a sentence or two you may speak about the back story in the second paragraph for example um, take the case of that scene where hamlet tells claudius that uh, when he asked where is polonius he says that he is where he is eaten so if that's given as an annotation you can say that hamlet stabs polonius in the arras scene in act dash scene dash and uh, uh, while he dines with claudius and the queen uh, when que- when the king asks where polonius is the the prince replies that he is not where he eats but he is where he is being eaten and then you may go on to explain and analyze that you can definitely do that because that that gives the evaluator an impression that you know the context and what led to it and what proceeds it or what precedes it so a minute guys i'll also take a small drink break drink some water and resume
All right. Hello, everybody, once again. And I think we have most of you marking your attendance. So let's continue with our session. So, yeah. So we were discussing about uh, how to write the exams. And uh, there is this one link that I wanted to share with you in that regard. And it um, seems I forgot. Just a second. Still people coming in. Oh, my God. Okay. Just a second. I'd like to share a link with you. All right, I'd like to actually share two links with you. Link one is where you find assignment questions of MEG2, not only of this year, but of previous years too, which literally means that it could also be considered as an essay question or an annotation that you can have prospectively for your exams. The second link is the link of your previous year question papers. You can go back and have a look at that. And uh, for those uh, questions, you have clo clo close to you know two question papers per year per paper, which means 25 papers almost, 25 question model question papers to look back. To. Try at least practicing two to three to four so that it will help you score better marks. So work on that. I'm sure that will help you excel better. Speaking about the next part, essays. But then again, there is short, short note as well. Sometimes you may have to write short notes. Uh, let me put it simply this way. If it's for five marks, again, a quarter to one page. Or if it's 10 marks, two pages. When I say two pages, I mean two sides. For instance, if this is an A4 paper, this is one side and this is the other side. So two sides for 10 marks. So moving on to essay questions. Let's begin with the simplest things that you would ask. How many pages should we write, sir? What is the length of the essay? What ink should we use? <clears throat> well, these are kindergarten questions, but then let's keep it simple and straight. You can use any pen which is in blue or black ink. Ideally, do not mix the links. Do not use you know, one link for a, for a question and the other ink for another. But then you can, if you want, mix the inks for emphasis. For example, you can write the lines that you have by hearted in double quotes in black. And you can write the explanation in blue. That's totally fine. Or you can write the critical opinion, which you have by hearted in double quotes, in black and answer in blue or vice versa. <clears throat> but otherwise, do not mix between the ink. You may already know, do not use green and red. These are for principal or people at higher levels. Don't uh, try to be them unless and until you do that. You become that, but at least not in the exams. And uh, uh, as far as the length is concerned, I would say ideally three and a half to four pages. I mean sides. Yeah. Two pages, three and a half to four sides is what an essay demands you to write. You can go up to five pages, but then you won't get time to write all of them though. So I would say ideally that's the length that you need to be bothered about. And uh, um, just a second. So that's a length that you need to take care of. And uh, speaking about the structure of an essay, an essay also has a three-part structure. But then the second part is a bit different from annotation. You have a three-part structure that is introduction, body paragraphs, which would ideally be five to seven, and Conclusion, one to two paragraphs. Okay, so that's the structure for writing an essay. You should have a well-prepared introduction. 
you should have three sorry five to seven body paragraphs or eight is still fine five to seven eight body paragraphs and uh, you should conclude ideally in a paragraph but if you feel like you can have two paragraphs and it should be somewhat close to three and a half to four sides and uh, uh, they may give you yeah essay and they may give you some instructions thousand words thousand five hundred words so this is what it attributes to. and uh, if you ask me how to write or what to write there, that's another significant question that most of you are bound to ask me at this particular point of time. So let me see if I can show you an example. Just give me a second. I'm looking for, well, when it comes to getting the question papers, you have to go deep down that link go to not even social sciences, School of Humanities, where you find the last option is Masters in English. And you have to go to British Drama and the program in English, and then you get the question paper. So it takes some time. Just give me a second. I'm trying to get hold of a previous year question paper. I shall put that on screen and give you a demo on how to write, say. Okay, so here I'm going to share my screen with you and uh, share the question paper. And I'll tell you how to look at it. Yep, I hope you can see my screen. I can enlarge the question paper a little bit if you want to, all right? Okay. So this is the question paper from June 2019. And uh, you can see that question one, which is annotation is compulsory, and then you have choice. So you have close to six. No, you, have, you had only five then. Generally, you have six uh, annotations of which you have to write four. In that year, there was only five. Um, yeah, generally there are six annotations. Sometimes it's five, that's okay. So you have to write those. If you can see here, there are all those lines given, not only one line, but then the entire passage, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Oh, I could still remember it pretty well. Take up arms against the sea of troubles, to die, to sleep, no more. Yeah, the entire thing is given. We have discussed how to write this, so I'm not going on back to that again. But look at this. Discuss Dr. Faustus as a tragedy. Or say, examine critically the idea of martyrdom in Eliot's murder in the cathedral. Or say, for example, discuss Hamlet as a revenge play. So the way you answer the essay is based on what the question is about. Or for that sake, uh, look at a question like, uh, critically comment on the character of Elisa in Pygmalion. Or discuss Waiting for Godot as a play that presents the existentialist, existentialist crisis of a modern man. Or gender and class conflict are central to look back in anger. Yeah. So these questions depend on uh, the way you look at the... Uh, and, uh, each question expects you to cover various aspects. For example, these two questions are simpler for me. Because when you speak about tragedy or a revenge play, there are certain attributes associated to it. So all you need to do is to discuss those attributes. What are those attributes? For example, take the case of revenge play. I don't exactly remember all the seven, eight attributes. You can Google that. Google will tell you the seven to eight attributes. But a few of them are in a revenge play, there will be a murder. There would be the presence of a ghost. There will be the revenge motive. And uh, the play ends where the revenge is succeeding or the revenge is taken. So there are, say, six to seven points when it comes to a revenge play. So wait, what should be your introduction? Your introduction should be on the lines of the question. For example, I'll give you a few examples here. Discuss Dr. Forces as a tragedy. So you can begin 
the introduction by saying dr foster's is a renaissance play written by uh, uh, dr foster's is a play written by the uh, renaissance playwright christopher marlowe christopher marlowe was a university with uh, who had written popular plays like edward the second dido of catharj and blah 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 uh, dr foster's uh, is uh, considered to be one of his best tragedies and maybe one more line on those lines and uh, then you can uh, move on to the second half that is five to seven paragraphs where you would generally ideally summarize the story that would still earn you say 10 to 12 13 marks or if you know the attributes of the tragedy it will be better that you discuss what tragedy is so the second paragraph can be tragedy is a genre in drama which is considered to be supreme by the classical greek critics like aristotle aristotle for instance places tragedy higher to comedy and discusses concepts of tragedy in his work poetics and then you can speak about how tragedy evolves into the elizabethan or renaissance theater how christopher marlowe's concert uh, plays with the theme and how dr foster's becomes a tragedy as a play. You can also speak about how Faustus brings in that elements of a tragic hero. There is a hamartia or a tragic flaw that Faustus possesses. Despite being a man of learning, he brings upon himself his fall and the fall is justified in that sense. And you go on explaining that for five to seven paragraphs. And the conclusion should be that uh, it could, like I told you about the annotation, it could be a critical comment, maybe a general statement of Marlowian style. Okay, it could be about uh, the genre as such, or the role played by Marlowe when bringing up that sort of tragedies, or it could be a comparison to the modern day life where people are all towards evil and nuclear warfare and so on. So that's up to you, but then that's how your conclusion should be. Again, looking at another example, Hamlet as a revenge play. That question is a bit tricky. You know, the question should have been discuss Hamlet as a revenge tragedy. Because revenge tragedy is a genre. It's a renaissance genre. So again, you begin uh, the introduction by saying uh, Hamlet is a play by a renaissance playwright William Shakespeare, who is considered to be one of the greatest writers ever to have graced on this earth. And then you go on to say that uh, Hamlet is the longest of the tragedies written by William Shakespeare and it has as its protagonist the youngest of the characters among his four tragedies. His four tragedies include King Lear, Macbeth, there was one more, I forgot, yeah, Othello and Hamlet. And then you can say that um, Shakespeare has uh, crafted Hamlet in such a way uh, in the model of the uh, revenge plays popularized by his contemporary playwrights like Thomas Kidd, KYD. And then from second paragraph onwards, you can start speaking about what a revenge tragedy is. So maybe you can dedicate a single paragraph, that is a second paragraph completely, to describe the attributes of revenge plays. Like I said, when the play begins, a murder occurs, then there is an existence of a ghost, the ghost asks to uh, avenge the murder. This revenge motive uh, ends up in uh, executing the murderer. And there are a few more points. I forgot what exactly it is. So you can state these points in a paragraph, then take five to six paragraphs, assessing each point in context of the play. Are they existent in the play? How does it happen? What are the tools used to make it effective? Blah, blah, blah. And as you conclude, for example, you can say uh, Shakespeare perfected the revenge tragedy when compared to his contemporaries like Thomas Kidd. When it comes to Shakespeare, he uses dramatic devices like soliloquy, which gives an extra mileage to the play and its effect. Blah, blah, blah. And you can conclude that essay. Or again, when the genre changes, look at a question like critically comment on the character of Eliza and Pygmalion. So here, what you are asked to write is the character, spe character sketch. So in a way, a summary would do. You can begin by saying that Pygmalion is a play written by George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw was a playwright who hails from blah, blah, blah. His plays, his major plays include dash, dash, dash. And uh, in Pygmalion, he ridicules 
the high class manners of the society the norwegian society and then you can move on to the second paragraph and say elisa do little uh, the female protagonist of the play as the play opens we can see that she is a flower girl and uh, uh, professor henry higgins has a bet with colonel pickering and uh, she takes her as she takes he takes her as his ward and he tries to mold her just like pygmalion does to his sculpture then briefly elaborate the pygmalion myth and uh, s- uh, reveal how elisa is trapped between higgins and his bet and how she gets out of his clutches and uh, decides to move on with freddy all you need to do in that sense is a summary in that question that's all that question requires you to do in the meanwhile if you go to say for example something like discuss waiting for godo as a play that presents the existentialist crisis of modern man then of course again you have to speak about samuel beckett as a playwright his major plays uh, <coughs> how <coughs> how he wrote plays where i mean how he wrote plays like say craps last cape or end game uh, which deals with the existentialist crisis of man of modern man and how waiting for godo falls in the that lineage and then you go on explaining what uh, absurd theater is what martin eslin told about that and how those essences can be seen in the play how the existentialist crisis of a modern man in a post war ny get materialized in waiting for godo and then have a proper conclusion and wrap it up any other question yeah again gender and class conflict so look back in anger kitchen sink drama the attributes blah 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 and you can close that okay uh yeah i'd like to show you one more question paper again british drama oh i think the year is missing here i think it's well i don't remember which year this was must be december 2020 perhaps okay uh again first question compulsory annotation and then you have essays so this is one problem that you have if you study if you leave a play if they ask you with the or question you don't know both the plays then you stand to suffer but nonetheless examine dr foster as a tragedy of <coughs> i'm sorry <coughs> the aspirational renaissance man so here in the introduction or maybe the next paragraph you have to describe the elizabethan era as an era of renaissance a rebirth of interest in learning literature arts seafaring etc etc it was considered a golden age by historians like trevelyan and uh, renaissance was uh, quite central in terms of flourishing of arts and drama as well and dr foster's the uh, eponymous character is a typical renaissance man and in the pursuit of learning because he went towards a harmless sorry a harmful path of learning that is necromancy he met his inevitable tragedy so he would be elaborating it in five to seven paragraphs then have a befitting conclusion and on and on and on again here all is required is summary so have an introduction have a conclusion summarize the four temptations and how beckett confronts it the question is done there again the same but again you can also involve in a critical commentary of soliloquies of hamlet soliloquies are the keys to lock to unlock hamlet's soul there is a proper you know a particular comment made by a critic soliloquies are a key with which you can unlock hamlet's soul so that's what the function they do in the play so you can elaborate that and uh, go on with that critically comment on the verbal comedy in pygmalion you have to even though you don't write the dialogues and double quotes at least you have to uh, paraphrase a few of them you should say that the verbal comedy occurs when there is this dad and that 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 and maybe she tries to speak in high english and at times she speaks of low english the cockney dialect and it causes confusion blah 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 so if you don't know that it's better you don't attempt that and generally you have one question which is general like this the salient features of the age so you have to speak about people almost all playwrights there christopher marlowe william shakespeare ben johnson john webster even though he's not prescribed for you and if possible ikar jones okay 
again discuss waiting for god was an episode play all the elements of an episode play like i told you rejection of realism individuality <coughs> illogical blah 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 put all those points together as is how it functions in the play then you are saved all right so i hope you have an idea of how to write an essay by now again i'll give you sufficient time for questions if you have any the floor is open again if you have questions on how to write an essay if i have fallen short somewhere or if i have missed out something while explaining this you may feel free to ask in the meanwhile before you ask or uh, before you prepare for those questions uh, there is one more thing i'd like to add i told you have a well prepared introduction and conclusion if you go through the previous year question papers you can somewhat predict most of the questions so you can practice and prepare a good introduction and a conclusion which will fetch you good marks uh, even though i cannot say this on record there may be teachers you know everywhere there are good people and bad people there are people who are lazy so there may be a few who won't bother to read all your answers they may be experienced people as i said retired hands they don't need to read through all the lines they may know by looking at an introduction and a conclusion so there may be people who depend only on your introduction and conclusion they may not read the summary that you have written in between so it's ideal that you have an introduction and a conclusion pre made and you somehow put that in the paper yeah that helps and uh, when you do that or even if you don't do that get rid of stereotypical cliche statements like for instance william shakespeare is the greatest playwright ever because you would end up writing the same for all the five essays you would say william shakespeare is the greatest playwright ben johnson is the greatest playwright uh, who else uh, samuel beckett is the greatest absurd playwright yeah maybe the phenomenon would change but the greatest bestest estest would continue so that's one thing the moment the teachers see that they cut marks for you so don't do that bring something innovative it's okay even if you have a a a, a contesting view point for instance in mg1 once a student was answering the question to the wasteland as a ts eliot's the wasteland is a champion of modernism the essay begins thus ts eliot is a pseudo modern who ruined the aesthetical appreciation of modernism that originated in the early half of 20th century in britain and other parts of europe imagine a teacher evaluating say a set of 30 papers first paper begins ts eliot is the greatest poet ever second paper ts eliot is the greatest modern poet ever third paper ts eliot is the modern greatest poet ever fourth paper fifth paper sixth paper then all of a sudden a paper comes saying ts eliot is someone who's a pseudo modernist who ruined uh the aesthetics of modernist appreciation by writing a city of work like the wasteland trust me any teacher would give that guy say an 18 out of 20 or 17 out of 20 whatever is maximum permissible provided he is given valid arguments later that's there so try to have some innovative methods to impress the one who is evaluating your papers get rid of the stereotypes the cliches don't write the greatest bestest blah 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 or he was born in stratford upon avon he had two wives three kids the third kid's name is john james least bothered and uh, even in your assignments we know all these things tell us something that appeals to us rather than stating the facts put it in an attractive package okay the floor is open for questions if there is any area of ambiguity any confusion that you would like to ask and share feel free to. yeah Sir. yes please uh, i used to answer the questions from the last that means uh, starting from the essays is there any problem with starting no problem. with an essay no problem you can jumble with the pattern nobody is asking you to write from 1 to 5 or 1 to 10 you can start from 7 then go to 5 you can go to 1 you can go to 8 but make sure you put the correct question numbers okay sir 
that's one mistake that people make while jumbling across so make sure you put the correct question number then there is no problem the sequence does not matter at all thank you sir All right. In the meanwhile, I have one more tip for you. There are so many students who come to me, saying, especially for papers like MEG two, because they have annotation and short notes and essays. Uh, students come to me and say, uh, time management was a difficult thing. They ended up missing a couple of annotations, or they ended up missing an essay. Most of them could write only seventy to eighty marks, and they missed up this or that. So, okay. So that's one thing. That most of the students tell me. So I have a solution for that. Whether it's whether it works or not, the solution that I have for you is divide these questions into a proper time frame. Often, to the normal learners of English literature, I tell them to divide double the amount of marks, the time to write an answer. Generally, they have fifteen mark essays. So I say divide or dedicate thirty to thirty five minutes for essays. If it's a five mark short note, take ten minutes for that. Maximum twelve minutes for that. So what happens is, by the time they double it, it ends by say two hour fifty five minutes. They have five minutes at their disposal for free. In your case, that's not exactly the case because uh, if if I double twenty into forty, and uh, say four questions, it becomes one sixty, and uh, you have four annotations. Ten into four forty would mean two hundred minutes, and the three hours is one eighty minutes. And uh, the twenty minutes extra you won't get, which means you will end up sacrificing two annotations. So my suggestion for you is take thirty minutes for one essay, which means you will get two hours to answer four essays. Then spend ten minutes each for an annotation, which means you will get forty minutes to write the annotation. So two hour forty minute your exam is technically over, and whatever you have missed, you can go back and continue writing. So that's what I say. For example, I told you three and a half to four pages for an essay. You start answering essays first. So take thirty minutes. Okay, at thirty minute you have finished only three pages. Leave a page blank. Turn the page aside. Start answering the next essay. Say you have reached three and a half pages. There is a conclusion to be written. Leave it right there. At one hour, move on to the third question. And after two hour forty minutes, you know where you stand and what question needs to be prioritized. Because you do this, you at least get say twelve uh, for all the essays if you have written well, because all that you have not written is a conclusion. Perhaps you can simply come back and if you have if you don't have time, you can conclude in two to three lines. So still you may get fifteen instead of eighteen. Yeah. So that's one way that I suggest to my students. Most of them have come back to me and. Thanked me for that. That works. So you write all the answers. You don't miss any question. You don't write any question half. You somewhat write a quarter of all the questions. And the last five to ten minutes, the marathon that you do, you end up concluding all the essays and annotations with whatever time you have left. Yeah. So that's the suggestion I have for you. Again, questions if you have any. If not, we'll move on to the last section. Where there is nothing but open flow, and I'll also share a lot of links for you. Thank you. Can be reserved for the last five minutes. Don't worry. We are in the middle of essays. Don't digress. If you say thank you, everybody would start saying that. We can reserve that for the last five minutes. Yes, Nirubama. Uh, so sorry again. Uh, the uh, concept of kitchen sink drama, the sink and the sink, sir. Please. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Nirubama. Uh, maybe I'll come back to that in another five minutes, Nirubama. Because if there is any question from the essay, I don't want to digress, because this is such a crucial element in your exam point of view. So, anybody would like to have any more questions regarding the essay writing format? Yeah. Anybody? എനിക്ക് എല്ലാവർക്കും ക്ലിയർ ആയോ എസ് എങ്ങനെയാണ് എഴുതേണ്ടതെന്ന് 
Did I simplify it quite enough for your comprehension? Sir, yes. can you hear me? A clear aisle, clear aisle. Hello? Hello? It's not about word limit, dear. It's about how far would you write for 20 marks? You cannot simply write one page and hope that they'll give you 20 marks. Yeah. So ideally, three and a half to four pages would be required for you to get somewhere around, say, 15 to 16 to 17 to 18. They won't give you 20 out of 20 for English. So say 17 marks or 18 marks. That's all that you're going to get, no matter how well you write. So... Yes, Martina, please. Uh, sir, there is a, if we get a question like waiting for Godot as an absurd play, uh, can we write the introduction as theater of the absurd as an intro? Uh, I would say that begin by identifying the contest author and the play and the genre and use the second paragraph to give a description of the theater of the absurd. Okay, sir. Whenever you have a phenomena, I'm not speaking, say, take any paper, MEG1, MEG2, MEG3. Say, for example, analyze... Uh, Tom Jones as a picaresque novel. The first paragraph should be Henry Fielding. Uh, oh, sorry, Tom Jones is a, a picaresque novel written by Henry Fielding. Henry Fielding is regarded as one of the pioneers of modern British novel, along with Tobias Smollett and uh, Samuel Richardson. And uh, Tom Jones is a picaresque novel because blah, blah, blah in a sentence. The second paragraph is picaresque novel originates from the word picar, which means rogue. And you go on to describe the attributes of picaresque novel. And from the next paragraph, as a third paragraph onwards, you try to assess how far Tom Jones is picaresque as per the attributes. Okay, sir. Thank you. I believe that's a more rational scientific approach rather than beginning with the method, then going to the author. It's better you recognize the author, the work, the context, then go to the phenomena and explain that. Even, for example, assess the wasteland as a modernist play, modernist poem. You begin by writing about T.S. Eliot, the wasteland, his other poems like Four Quartets. Then you take modernism or modernity into context, define the features of modernism, then assess how the poem fits into that modernist mold. Or take, uh, for instance, Portrait of Artists as a Young Man as a stream of consciousness novel. In the first paragraph, describe who James Joyce is, what portrait of the artist is, how it is autobiographical in nature, for instance. And then in the second paragraph, describe what a stream of consciousness novel is, who are the exponents of that, and what is the benefit of that. Uh, I can also put it this way. Consider the second paragraph of such questions as a short note being written. Imagine you are writing a five-mark short note. What is stream of consciousness? What is picaresque novel? What is realism? Or what is a kitchen sink drama? So I hope that will be better for you. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Krishna Maya, that's why I said answer to the question. You need not write unnecessary things. For example, Shakespeare was born in Stratford upon Avon and he was born to a shoemaker's family or he, his parents starved to death or his father was a schoolmaster or he, had a, he, had, he married twice. He had five children. These are unnecessary to the context. So stick on to the order, maybe the basic phenomena. If there's a historical fact, well and good. Biographical details are least required in a question paper, I mean, in an answer paper. Unless the question demands it, for instance. All right. So thank you. I hope I have solved that query. Uh, I'll quickly rush through the kitchen sink drama. Niru has been quite bothered about my explanation back then and uh, it becomes my responsibility to explain to you what kitchen sink is and uh, uh, that day I was an angry young man so I did end up confusing you. I'm aware of that. So let me brief to you what kitchen sink drama is about. It is in fact a rather condescending title applied from the late 1950s onwards in Britain to the then new wave of realistic drama depicting the family lives of the working class characters on stage and in broadcast plays 
and uh, such works for example by writers like arnold wesker alan owen and uh, john osborne etc were at that time a notable departure from the conventions of middle class drawing room drama and uh, uh, you must also note that um, it is often used derogatory it's not something that's used positively critics use the word kitchen sink derogatorily applied in place which uh, in which uh, a realistic fashion showed aspects of these working class life at the time and the implication what was that the place centered metaphorically or psychologically and in some cases literally on the kitchen sink you all know what kitchen sink is again malayali audience uh, would go back to the latest movie called uh, uh what was that um mere jio baby da padam oh my god great indian kitchen yeah great indian kitchen realism of the lower middle class household so something like that a play which portrays it metaphorically psychologically or even literally uh on the kitchen sink can be called as the kitchen sink drama and uh uh that's as simple a definition that i can give you for example in arnold wesker's play roots which was written in the year 1959 he actually begins that play with one character doing the dishes in a kitchen sink so it shows the day to day common life of uh, lower class middle class people in britain and how uh, the kitchen sink and the drawing room dramas unfolded in the post war uh britain and how angry young men surfaced from it and mostly their heroes the protagonists were basically not heroes but anti heroes as in the case of um our protagonist jimmy carter that's another technical term that i forgot to tell you anti hero by malayalathile pradinayagan annaka par yeah just like the character of shammi in that movie kumbalangi nights technic then he is an anti hero yeah so i hope that's clear uh, niru nirbama yes sir thank you yeah. okay so um yeah quickly uh, okay i i also forgot to mention i i did tell you go back and check the phenomenon like expressionism along with it also check for the term memory place again associated with the american playwright tennessee williams he coined that term and the memory plays are a technique in drama that flashback us to movies in order to reveal the past uh tennessee williams empro- employs a lot of imagery like a white blank screen uh, a sort of peculiar lights to depict various moods certain music and blah 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 so you can go back and refer to that from the web or any other sources that i'm going to share with you today so let me quickly share you or share with you a few links Uh, i'm sharing with you the downloadable links for your ease of access uh i told you that uh, mh abraham's glossary is one book that you can go back and refer to so the 2012 edition is something that's uh, easily available in the ok as i i had shown that book to you yesterday so you can go download mh abraham's glossary of the literary terms if you want to uh you can also depend on other glossaries like i told you there are plenty of other glossaries which deals with literary terms so one such as the routledge edition to literary terms again the downloadable link is on your chat box then there is this masterpiece i would say definitely get this downloaded i know it's difficult for you to read it completely in your lifetime but people like digimol who tell me that ningal vera domain inu vannittu science background inu ka vannittu thank you critical terms manasilavunnilla nu parayunavarku etto helpful aaya penguin de edition aanu ee book but then that page is that book is 1000 page long so it, it may take a lifetime for you to complete reading it but at least skim through it selectively it's titled the penguin dictionary of literary terms and literary theory that book would come handy for you especially next year when you learn a paper like literary criticism and theory mg5 okay so go through that book the next one that i'm going to share is the bedford glossary of critical and literary terms fourth edition and unlike other links that i share with you which are in pdf format uh, 
This is in DJVU format. Sometimes your computer or mobile would refuse to refuse to open the downloaded file. So you need not panic. All you need to do is go to Google and type DJVU to PDF converter, have the downloaded file into that converter and have it converted into PDF. It is again one of the best glossaries that you would ever come across. It's an immensely resourceful glossary when it comes to especially study of drama and critical literary terms. Then again, I'd like to share with you a new handbook of literary terms edited by David Mikix. It's another book that you may treasure uh, in order to understand the concept simply. And most of these books would also be helpful to you while trying to learn MEG4. As you know, MEG4 is no cakewalk. Uh, there are people who find it really difficult. So that's one book that would help you learn these concepts better. Apart from that, I'm also sharing the concise Oxford Dictionary of Literary Terms, which would also serve as a good guide to you. So you may follow these links, and uh, if you feel like, you can comfort with these uh, books, and you can read and relish and uh, gain from them. Moving on, I'd like to share a few video links with you. And uh, this would partly account to the text that we were not able to touch amidst our hectic schedule. So sharing here with the playboy of the Western world, the game Singh, also sharing the Vimeo ed edition of the same. Some are downloadable, some are not. You may view that as and when you get time. I'm also sharing here with the discussions by Dr. V. Harry Haran in the uh, EPG Patshala network. Also various editions of the same play. You may comfort yourselves with this place. I'm also sharing with you a Midsummer Night's Dream. As you know, it is also a wonderful play written by William Shakespeare. Sometimes most of you would like that. And again, I'm also sharing the audiobook editions of The Alchemist, as well as a modern adaptation of the play last year. So you may go back to these links and uh, try to have a better understanding of these topics. And uh, we have maybe four more minutes. And now, again, it's open if you have any general queries or if you feel like you want to have a Thanksgiving or you want to say something or you have any career-related doubts or whatever you feel like, the floor is open for your expression once again. I would like to speak minimal in the next four, five, six minutes. The floor is declared open. I have shared as much as I can within the limited time frame and constraints that I had. I hope I was, I was able to help you better. At least I was able to give you pointers towards better learning environments. And uh, it was in indeed my pleasure taking class for you over the last 10 days, over the two weeks, except a day apart where we had slightly at odds. Uh, I would say that I really love teaching you all, especially receiving your mails, understanding that you're all so keen and enthusiastic to learn and relish in the world of theater. I'm so happy to have met you all. And I'd also like to say that once and when the offline mode restarts in RC Coach in Kalur, you may feel free to join my offline class, come for my MEG2 uh, classes someday. And uh, we can share a lot of interesting stories and act certain plays and sort of lock and have a lot more fun than this. Uh, Shaila Priya, generally, yes, NET is a qualification, a basic qualification required to become an assistant professor. But then in a lot of self-financing colleges, they do apply, they do take people who are just fresh postgraduates too. NET is not considered that mandatory as of now. Oh my God, so many people are writing essays. I'm really, I'm really flattered by your benevolence. I'm really glad that you acknowledge the efforts taken. 
thank you so much and uh, this does not end we'll meet again next year if the covid situation prevails we'll meet online discussing mag5 literary criticism and theory as well as mag14 uh, contemporary uh, classics and translation in indian translation and also mag16 folk literature in indian english so uh, we'll definitely see again this world is a merry go round place yes sri devi sir this mag14 class which starts on 23rd are you going to handle it sir of course who else <laughs> yeah sir i would like to you know i would like to attend one class if it is permissible by you why one come attend all five who stop it <laughs> Uh, second year students should not lose out the chance to attend your class that is why uh, uh, i don't uh, see i would say you attend the first class yeah. i can bet that there won't be more than 50 people because it's an optional paper okay 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 yeah so you would so, so you would be reassured that only if you come i'd be able to teach you know? <laughs> that's how it happens in the optional papers okay so second so, thing i wanted yeah. to ask is Uh, yes, please. Uh, 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 the kitchen sink drama that we have, we were referring to right now. So in yeah. that you have given us the example of uh, the recent Malayalam movie. Okay. Yeah. So in that uh, the boy, uh, the man. Okay. The That's my husband. interpretation. Okay. That's my interpretation. Yeah. I'm not saying that that yes, belongs sir. to a stereotype. Norm- yeah. No, no, no. Normally, yeah. uh, the man should belong to a middle class family, you know. But then he is from a good family, yeah. a good family. Yeah, in that he, yeah, yeah. But but but, but you know the, 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 the reference. No, no, the reference that I made to is that the mm-hmm. camera focuses on the grave realities of the kitchen of that mm-hmm. household. Okay. So, okay. in a way, in that film, that man belongs to a good, you know, a good high class community because the the playwright or the you know the filmmaker wanted to show the startling contrast. Okay. Even in the resultant discussions, it was mm-hmm. pointed out that it is you know even in a very rich even in a very rich household. Hi, the kitchen is a negative yeah. space. Yeah. Okay, okay. So imagine the case of the other. And he's a flat character, no sir. Yeah, yeah he's, he's a flat, flat character. character. Yeah, he's he a flat character. He, does not, he doesn't change. Yeah. Okay, sir. And I'm really glad that you guys are learning these technical terms quite well. In okay. offline classes, I try my best, and there are people who will still end up confusing these terms: individual type, flat character, round character. I have to explain it in every class. Generally. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I'll 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 attend your class on twenty third. <laughs> sure, even all of you can join. There is no limit, I suppose. Of course, the hundred per- people limit is there, but then I don't think uh, any any more than fifty sixty people are going to come. By the experience I had teaching your seniors before your classes started, there were barely forty to fifty people on a regular note for MEG five, which is a compulsory paper. So I don't think I I don't expect anybody more than that count for the. Classes from twenty third. So actually, I'm still confused between M E G fourteen and M E G sixteen. Opting for which one? So I just thought I'll attend your class for some reason. I would st- I would still say if you have problems with Malayalam language, don't opt M E G sixteen. Okay. Yeah. You uh-huh. I mean not Malayalam language, any language for that sake. Opt uh-huh. for M E G fourteen. Even uh-huh. comparative literature is better M E G fifteen because there are domains or departments titled departments of translation or department of comparative studies. You go to Hyderabad University, there is a, mm-hmm. an entire branch called uh, department of comparative studies. So that will help you even pursue another masters in that domain. Okay, sir. Yeah. What about offline classes? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't get you. Uh, so can you uh, tell me about uh, you, offline classes you so that uh, you are giving offline classes no 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 what i said is after the covid scenario is over as and when say one year later six months later two years later three years later whenever the offline classes restarts i'll definitely be taking classes in kalur rc hopefully unless and until they fire me or i decide to resign i definitely be continuing there i enjoy teaching the mag students the papers that they have given me are papers that are of my liking so i'll be there hopefully so when the offline classes restarts you can feel free to walk in nobody is going to ask you to get out of the place igno rc kalur is one such place where it's like the story in three idiots in three idiots amir khan says go to a school wear the uniform of that school and if they if they catch you change the uniform change the school you still get the lesson but there nobody really bothers you just go there write your name 
say that you are an MEG student, write your enrollment number. You just walk in. Simple as that. Nobody is going to ask you to get out unless you do something which is undesirable. It's a learning space. So how do we know about the classes going on? For that, you will have to contact the RC, the people who are concerned uh, with the office staff or Prema Ma'am, for instance. You can contact them. And uh, I think Sri Devi also show, told about a website. Maybe that website would put in those details. I'm not sure. So that those could be the ways in which you could figure out that the classes are going on. But you're most welcome. Because offline classes are an entirely different mold. Like, I'm really glad that some of you have been so benevolent with your comments. And uh, Shaila in particular, I've actually not done anything out of the way. You know, when I take online classes, the reason why I love teaching IGNU is, I believe that in a knowledge-based society, well, let's say renaissance society, uh, knowledge is something that helps us or that empowers us. And it alters our thought process. It is something that should make us live beyond the prejudices of stereotypes, of class, caste, other highs, lows, race, blah, 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 whatever it is. It helps us break all those stereotypes. And uh, uh, what is the use of knowledge if you cannot have it for the service of the society, of a social cause? So apart from the full-time job that I do in a college called Rajagiri College of Social Sciences from Monday to Saturday, there are two jobs in particular which I am associated with. One is a program, an initiative by the Kerala state government called the Additional Skill Acquisition Program, ASAP, which is for the plus one, plus two learners of the schools who are from an economically and socially poor background. The second is IGNU, where I address the MEG learners. And I do these two things, despite being hands full with my Monday to Saturday job, because I am trying to help people who are from the you know, de deprived or problematic sections of the society. People who have dropped out from the college, say, 10 years ago, coming back to learn uh, things back out of passion, out of request, maybe out of having an identity for oneself. I know plenty of cases of women who are abused by their spouses at house or their families at house saying that you are just a graduate. You are stupid. You don't know to learn. You don't have a degree. So they come back to IGNU to get empowered. So I'm just extending a hand to help them. And I always believe that your time and my time is equally valuable. When I say I lecture to you for two hours, I have a commitment towards yourself and myself. I look at you from my own shoes. For example, if there is Sridevi over there or Nirupama over there or Joel over there, I look at Joel as myself. I am sitting in my class and listening to me. How far can I comprehend this nonsense for two hours? How far can I be useful? That's why I often stress on giving you pointers, resources to go back to. Because lectures are boring. I know that. Online mode has further limitations. So I try to incorporate videos. I try to give you those links. I try to give you uh, the you know books. And I try to incorporate all sorts of learners, not listeners, audiovisual learners, by heart read write learners, by heart learners, people who are vernacular. I don't think any other teacher would tell you, go and look at the equivalence of Balram, especially traditional English teachers. Nobody is going to tell you that. But I believe any domain should be result-oriented. And what is result? Result is what you gain. Result is not getting 90 marks out of 100. At the beginning of the course, if you think with your language, you would struggle to score 40 or 45. By the end of the time, if you get 50, I would say that's a result. You are a champion. You're not a champion because you score 90 marks. You're a champion because you score 50 when you think you will score 40. Or if you think you'd fail, you pass the paper, I would say you're a champion. So I try to build your lives in whatever little ways I could with the sort of learning that I've had. And I don't think it's a big deal. Perhaps I think that's the responsibility of every teacher. Fortunately or unfortunately, some choose to do that. Some choose to take this carelessly or some choose to uh, you know, give exceptions and think that, okay, chalta hai, this will go on like this, whatever I do, these people would learn themselves, or oh, this is distant learning, blah, blah, blah. I don't think distant learning is a second grade thing. And in fact, I must say that the, the content that most of you have after two years of exposure at IGNU is far better than the regular learners in, say, MG University, Kote, or Kerala University. I'm sure you would speak about flat characters and round characters another year later in an interview. 
and a person who had a regular learning would say i'm sorry i don't know what it is i can bet that it's not my merit but i tell you your your syllabus is so rich your study material is immensely rich you only need to go through your blocks you can easily crack net that's the best study guide you'll ever get anything else we are indeed running out of time but then yeah i'm just trying to reassure you that you can come out in flying colors <laughs> varsha mg4 is not my cup of tea linguistics phonetics i just run away okay if you have nothing else to ask we'll call it a day and for the second years out there we'll meet you on the 23rd i have a two days of voice rest tomorrow and the day after and i have to come back and have a five day session on translation with the second years i don't think i'll be able to meet you any time this year see you next year if the situation prevails and if we have this online mode still existing Thank you for the wonderful uh, sessions that we had with you, sir. Appreciate all the hard work that you have done for us. It's my pleasure, Jennifer. That's why I said it needn't be thanked. You know, even though thanking is in form of an acknowledgement, that makes me feel motivated and kicking when I go for the next batch. But then, apart from that, I'm just doing my duty. Nothing else. Varsha, were you trying to say something? Yes, sir. I have a literary book uh, with me. Mm -hmm. I'll show you, and uh, can you tell me that the book that you said earlier? Ah, uh, book? Can I book? I don't know. Ah, there, there. Okay. Yeah, please, of course. Why not? Yeah, that is M. H. Abraham's Glossary of Literary Terms, Varsha. Ah, uh, I am going to read the PDF. I didn't know there was a difference. I am going to read the PDF. It is the latest edition. So, okay, कुछ मुड़ी चरिये चला एडिटिंग में चला पुदिया वाक्य लो कहलो वाना टोटा। Okay sir. Yeah. Anything else? Sir, yes sir, please. Sir, you can sir you can teach M E G five uh, a criticism in online class in future. I have already done that. I had as a, you know ten day streak with the second years from April twenty three onwards. I completed that, and then your classes started for M E G two. Oh sir, And I missed it. Sorry. Doesn't matter. Next six months hmm. again, there will be a tenure. We have batches every six months, you see. So by next September or August or something, I'll have another batch of M E G five. And we'll again meet. No worries. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Yeah. And I think uh, those evening, sessions sir. would be uploaded in the R C website. Yes, please. Uh, good evening, sir. R C is this yes. side, sir, from uh, Odisha, sir. Namaste, uh, sir. Thank you very much. How's things Kaise going? Hai, How's yeah, things with fine, you? Sir. Are you on COVID Mostly duty too? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have I, actually. I am principal of uh, this uh, training establishment. So I have almost five hundred uh, uh, commandos in Achha. my campus. Uh huh. And, Please take uh, precautionary measures, sir. I feel so def, def, concerned def, about def, the policemen because they def, are there to save our lives on daily life, and they have to mandatorily do this. You know, thank you very much, sir. I, I will yes. not say thank you, sir, because uh, the way you are teaching all the students with your heart, basically. it is uh, beyond my word i don't have words basically and uh, we will be we will be we will be disturbing you through your email sir and no uh, problem that disturbance uh, is always considered a blessing and, feel free uh, actually you you give you give a student a confidence to Thank just you. express to express him, himself so keep, keep 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 doing this sir and uh, once again sir from our student side Uh, thank you very much and uh, very grateful, sir, uh, for attending your class, sir. Thank you very much. Same here, Ashish ji, and stay in touch. And as I told you, we have classes on twenty third for the second years, just in case. Yeah, yeah. You I, will that attending, I will be attending. I will be attending. M G four. Yeah. I have attended your M G five also, uh, sir. Yeah, I remember class. that. I remember yes. That. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we'll meet again in another two days. Yeah. Sir, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Excuse yes, me, sir. Yes, please, Mr. Bhuvan. Sir, request, sir. Even if you, if everything goes back to normal and you have offline classes, please attend your emails, sir. I'll be bothering you through my emails. I want no problem. Help. No problem. See, even when I go on offline classes, I tell them to mail me. So eventually, they'll be mailing me every day the way you do. So that's totally fine. Keep sending the mails, and uh, unless and until I'm in a hectic day, I'll be replying your mails every day. Don't worry. Thank you, sir. Such disturbances are always treated as a blessing. they are not at all disturbances 
unless and until say for example you mail me at 2 o'clock 3 o'clock in the morning and the mobile plings ping 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 otherwise that's totally fine all right yes somebody trying to unmute hello sir ah varsha pari നമ്മുടെ ഇമോഷൻസ് എപ്പോഴും നമ്മൾ നമ്മുടെ മാതൃഭാഷയെ പറയുമ്പോഴാണല്ലോ അത് കൂടുതൽ എക്സ്പ്രസീവ് ആവുന്നത് അതുകൊണ്ടല്ല സർ എനിക്ക് എന്താ പറയാ സാറിന്റെ ക്ലാസ് അത്രയും ബ്യൂട്ടിഫുൾ ആയിരുന്നു കാരണം ഇത്രയും ഹൺഡ്രഡ് സ്റ്റുഡൻസ് ഈ ക്ലാസ്സിൽ അറ്റൻഡ് ചെയ്യാന്ന് പറഞ്ഞു കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ അത്രയും നല്ല ക്ലാസ് ആയതുകൊണ്ട് തന്നെയാണ് ഇത്രയും ദിവസവും അത്രയും കുട്ടികൾ അറ്റൻഡ് ചെയ്യുന്നത് അപ്പൊ സാറിനോട് ആ ഗ്രാറ്റിറ്റ്യൂഡ് നമ്മുടെ ഭാഷയിൽ തന്നെ പറഞ്ഞെന്ന് എനിക്ക് തോന്നി നമ്മുടെ സ്വന്തം ഭാഷയിൽ പറയുമ്പോഴാണല്ലോ അതിന് കൂടുതൽ ഒരു വാല്യൂ ഉണ്ടാവുന്നത് അതുകൊണ്ട് ഞാനിപ്പോ ബി എഡ് കഴിഞ്ഞ ഒരു സ്റ്റുഡന്റ് ആണ് അപ്പൊ സാർ ഇങ്ങനെ ഒരു ക്ലാസ് എടുത്തപ്പോ എന്താ ഒരു ക്ലാസ് എങ്ങനെ എടുക്കാം നന്നായിട്ട് എങ്ങനെ എടുക്കാം എന്നുള്ളത് മനസ്സിലായി മിക്ക ടീച്ചേഴ്സും ലെക്ചർ ടൈപ്പാണ് ക്ലാസ് എടുക്കാറ് ലെക്ചറിംഗ് ആയിട്ടാണ് ക്ലാസ് എടുക്കാറ് ഓൺലൈൻ ആണെങ്കിലും ഓഫ്ലൈൻ ആണെങ്കിലും ലെക്ചറിംഗ് ആയിട്ട് അവരുടെ ക്ലാസ് എങ്ങനെയും കഴിഞ്ഞു പോകാം എന്നുള്ള ഒരു ആറ്റിറ്റ്യൂഡിൽ ആയിരിക്കും പക്ഷെ സാർ അത് എത്ര പെർഫെക്റ്റ് ആയിട്ട് എടുത്തു എന്നുള്ളത് ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് എല്ലാവർക്കും പറയാം അപ്പൊ ഞങ്ങളുടെ എല്ലാവരുടെയും പേരിൽ സാറിന് വലിയൊരു താങ്ക്സ് ആൻഡ് നിങ്ങൾക്ക് ഇഷ്ടമാവുന്ന ഏതൊരു ടീച്ചറിന്റെ ആട്രിബ്യൂട്ട് ഞാൻ ആരെയും ക്രിറ്റിക്കലി ഒന്നും കാണണ്ട എല്ലാവർക്കും അവരുടേതായ ഓരോ ആട്രിബ്യൂട്ട്സ് ഉണ്ട് ഇഷ്ടമല്ലാത്തത് നിങ്ങൾ ടീച്ചർ ആവുമ്പോൾ സ്വീകരിക്കാതിരിക്കുക ഇഷ്ടമാവുന്നത് നിങ്ങളുടെ ലൈഫിലേക്ക് എടുക്കുക വളരെ സിമ്പിൾ അല്ലേ അത് ഒരു ടീച്ചർ നിങ്ങളോട് ഇന്ററാക്ട് ചെയ്യുന്നു നിങ്ങൾക്ക് സന്തോഷം തോന്നുന്നു അല്ലെ മലയാളത്തിൽ ക്ലാസ് എടുക്കുന്നു നിങ്ങൾക്ക് കാര്യങ്ങൾ മനസ്സിലാവുന്നു നിങ്ങൾ ടീച്ചർ ആവുമ്പോൾ ക്ലാസ്സിൽ പോകുമ്പോൾ നിങ്ങൾ മലയാളത്തിൽ ക്ലാസ് എടുക്കുക കുട്ടികളോട് ഇന്ററാക്ട് ചെയ്യുക ഐ വുഡ് സേ ഇ റെസ്പെക്റ്റീവ് ഓഫ് ദ ലെക്ചർ when it comes to a classroom environment especially in an offline class what matters is how well you take care of your students simple things like a smile did you eat your lunch today did you have breakfast how is your family doing simple questions that would be enough for every learner to feel motivated and attracted to you or to respect you more that doesn't cost anything right athre ullu it's a very simple thing and eniki palappu albudana palarku ee simple karyam cheyan endra athre buddhimuttu നമ്മൾ അക്കാഡമിയിലേക്ക് ഇറങ്ങി ചെല്ലുമ്പോൾ പലരുടെയും നടപ്പും ഭാവവും കണ്ടു കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ ഞാനാണ് വില്യം ഷേക്സ്പിയർ എന്നെ കഴിഞ്ഞേ ഉള്ളു ലോകത്ത് ഇംഗ്ലീഷ് എന്ന മട്ടിലുള്ള നടക്കുന്ന ആൾക്കാരൊക്കെ ഉണ്ട് ഐ കൻ ഈവൻ ഷെയർ വൺ മോർ ഇൻട്രസ്റ്റിംഗ് സ്റ്റോറി വിത്ത് യു വെൻ ഐ സ്റ്റാർട്ട് മൈ പ്രൊഫഷൻ വേ ബാക്ക് ഇൻ ടൂ തൗസൻഡ് തേർട്ടീൻ ഫോർട്ടീൻ ബിക്കോസ് ഐ ഹാഡ് ക്രാക്ക് നെറ്റ് ഈ എൻ ഇ ടി പാസ് ആയ ഉള്ള ഒരു ഗുണം ഇസ് ദറ്റ് യു ക്യാൻ ഗോ ടു ടേക്ക് നെറ്റ് ക്ലാസ്സസ് സോ ഐ ഹാഡ് ക്രാക്ക് നെറ്റ് ആൻഡ് ഐ വാസ് ഇൻവൈറ്റഡ് ടു എ കോളേജ് വെർ ഐ ഹാഡ് സ്റ്റഡീഡ് ടു ടേക്ക് നെറ്റ് ക്ലാസ്സസ് so it was on a saturday that was holiday for them so they had told that the coordinator had told that she won't be there the rooms would be let open so i can go and the students will be there and i can teach so i went there i started taking classes and uh, the coordinator came say by 10 30 11 something and she stood outside the class looking at me taking the class and uh, she waited for me to give the break and then when it when i came out she told me that she is the coordinator she introduced herself to me and she congratulated me the way you did said that your classes are really good i could see the dedication with which you are teaching these students and the next thing that she told me was you needn't be this passionate towards these students because you are taking a net class you are a post graduate learner who have just post graduated you are going to get placed somewhere and if they get net they would be a competition to you see so there are people like that across us they are calling themselves teachers and the sort of prejudice pride or arrogance or unnecessary egos false notions that they carry are quite shocking i was literally shocked when that person told me this i would rather find it interesting i would always say that knowledge betters when we share that it's not that i am the encomium of all the knowledge hello it makes things easier when you keep it simpler it becomes easier everybody understands things in a simpler way though the jargon helps that's why i say when you say post to our nui it's a technical term if you write it you will get a better mark but at the same time in class you can say the post to our condition the circumstance the environment so that people would understand and i'm sure now you go back you would remember the word post to our nui yeah it's very simple it's not a complicated thing in yeah and an apologize to my to this batch is also that because there was a span indian audience i was not able to you know really be bilingual i couldn't give you too much of malayalam examples there were people who were so concerned about you know the language that i use and it's on record as well so i i apologize for that as well otherwise i would have really gone bilingual so you would have benefited a bit more from that sir oru doubt um kuda so nammal anengile p 
ടീച്ചിങ് പ്രൊഫഷൻ അല്ല വേറെ ഏതെങ്കിലും അതർ ദൻ പിന്നെ യു പി എസ് സി അങ്ങനെ വല്ലതും നോക്കുന്നവരാണെങ്കിൽ നമുക്ക് സെക്കൻഡ് ഇയറിലേക്ക് സബ്ജക്ട് സെലക്ട് ചെയ്യുമ്പോൾ എം ഇ ജി സിക്സ് അമേരിക്കൻ ലിറ്ററേച്ചർ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ എം ഇ ജി എയ്റ്റ് ന്യൂ ലിറ്ററേച്ചർ ഇൻ ഇംഗ്ലീഷ് എം ഇ ജി സിക്സ്റ്റീൻ ഫോക്ക് ലിറ്ററേച്ചർ ഇത് ഈ സബ്ജക്റ്റുകൾ എടുത്തു കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ നമുക്ക് എന്തെങ്കിലും ജോബ് മറ്റ് ടീച്ചിങ് അല്ലാതെ മറ്റ് ജോബ്സിന് വേണ്ടി എംബസി റിലേറ്റഡ് ആയിട്ടുള്ള ജോബുകൾക്ക് ട്രൈ ചെയ്യാം അമേരിക്കൻ ലിറ്ററച്ചർ എടുക്കുകയാണെങ്കിൽ ഞാൻ അന്ന് പറഞ്ഞിരുന്നല്ലോ ഈ കാശ് കൊടുത്ത് ഒരുപാട് ലൈബ്രറികൾ ഉണ്ടാക്കുന്ന സെറ്റപ്പ് ഒക്കെ ഇവര് നടത്തുന്നുണ്ട് ഇൻക്ലൂഡിംഗ് ഹൈദരാബാദ് യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയിൽ അപ്പൊ അവിടെയൊക്കെ നിങ്ങൾക്ക് ഇതുമായി ബന്ധപ്പെട്ട് എന്തെങ്കിലും ഒരു ജോലി സെർച്ച് ചെയ്യാം ഇന്റർപ്രറ്റർ ആയിട്ട് പോവാം അങ്ങനെ കുറെ പോസിബിലിറ്റീസ് ഉണ്ട് ലാംഗ്വേജ് എക്സ്പേർട്ട് ആയിട്ട് പോവാം നിങ്ങൾ ഒന്നും കൂടി ഈ പറഞ്ഞ ടൗ മറ്റേ ഡെൽറ്റ സെൽറ്റ പോലത്തെ കോഴ്സസ് ഒക്കെ ചെയ്യുകയാണെങ്കിൽ നിങ്ങൾക്ക് ആ രീതിയിൽ സോഫ്റ്റ് സ്കിൽ ട്രെയിനിങ് ഐ എൽ ടി എസ് അങ്ങനെയൊക്കെ പോവാം എം ഇ ജി ടെൻ ഇസ് ഓൾസോ എ ഗുഡ് ചോയ്സ് ഇന്ത്യൻ എഡ്യൂക്കേഷൻ ഓർ സംതിങ് ലൈക് ദാറ്റ് ആ എം ഇ ജി ടെൻ ഇസ് ഓൾസോ എ വെരി യൂസ്ഫുൾ പേപ്പർ അങ്ങനെ നോക്കുവാണ് ഏ അഞ്ചു ക്ലിയർ ആയോ ഞാൻ പറഞ്ഞത് സാറൊന്ന് പറഞ്ഞില്ലായിരുന്നു എം ഇ ജി ടെൻ ആണെങ്കിൽ ആ ക്ലിയർ ആയി സാർ എം ഇ ജി ടെൻ ആണെങ്കിൽ മെയിൻലി ബി എഡ് ാണ് പക്ഷെ പോളിസി മേക്കിങ്ങുമായിട്ട് ബന്ധപ്പെട്ടു ഒക്കെ ടെന്നിൽ നിന്ന് പിടിച്ച് കയറാൻ പറ്റും ബി എഡ് മാത്രല്ല ഞാൻ വീണ്ടും പറയുന്നു ഇഗ്നോയും ഇംഗ്ലീഷ് ആൻഡ് ഫോറിൻ ലാംഗ്വേജ് യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയും എം ഇ ജി യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയുടെ സോറി എം ജി യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയുടെ ഡിസ്റ്റൻസ് സെന്ററും ഒക്കെ പി ജി സി ടി ഇ എന്നും പി ജി ഡി ടി ഇ എന്നും രണ്ട് കോഴ്സ് കൊടുക്കുന്നുണ്ട് പോസ്റ്റ് ഗ്രാജുവേറ്റ് സർട്ടിഫിക്കറ്റ് ഇൻ ടീച്ചിങ് ഇംഗ്ലീഷ് ഡിപ്ലോമ ഇൻ ടീച്ചിങ് ഇംഗ്ലീഷ് ഐ തിങ്ക് അലിഗർ മുസ്ലിം യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയിലും ഉണ്ട് ഡിസ്റ്റന്റ് ആയിട്ട് നിങ്ങൾക്ക് വേണമെങ്കിൽ അത് ചെയ്യാവുന്നതാണ് അത് പക്ഷെ അത് എം എ ഉണ്ടെങ്കിലേ ചെയ്യാൻ പറ്റുള്ളൂ എം എ കിട്ടിയതിനു ശേഷം അല്ലെങ്കിൽ അതുപോലെ ഒരുപാട് സർട്ടിഫിക്കറ്റ് കോഴ്സസ് ഇഗ്നോ ഓഫർ ചെയ്യുന്നുണ്ട് നിങ്ങൾക്ക് ഫസ്റ്റ് ഇയർ കഴിയുന്ന സ്ഥിതിക്ക് ഡിസംബറിൽ വേണമെങ്കിൽ അതിനോ ഡിപ്ലോമ കോഴ്സുകൾക്കും ഒക്കെ എൻറോൾ ചെയ്യാം ഫോർ എക്സാമ്പിൾ പോസ്റ്റ് ഗ്രാജുവേറ്റ് ഡിപ്ലോമ ഇൻ ജേർണലിസം ആൻഡ് മാസ് കമ്മ്യൂണിക്കേഷൻ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ക്രിയേറ്റീവ് റൈറ്റിംഗ് ഇതിനൊക്കെ നിങ്ങൾക്ക് ട്രൈ ചെയ്യാവുന്നതാണ് അപ്പൊ അതുപോലെ തന്നെ എഡ്യൂക്കേഷന്റെ ഡിപ്ലോമ കോഴ്സ് ഉണ്ട് മാസ്റ്റേഴ്സ് ഉണ്ട് അപ്പൊ അതൊക്കെ നിങ്ങൾക്ക് വേണമെങ്കിൽ ട്രൈ ചെയ്ത് സൈഡ് ഈ സർട്ടിഫിക്കേഷൻസ് ബിൽഡ് ചെയ്ത് പോവാവുന്നതാണ് ആണ് അല്ല അല്ല വ്യത്യാസം ഞാൻ പറഞ്ഞല്ലോ ഒന്ന് ജോണർ സ്പെസിഫിക് ആണ് മറ്റേത് മിക്സ് ഓഫ് ജോണർ ആണ് സോ അതിൽ ഹൗ കംഫർട്ടബിൾ ആ യു ഇസ് ദ ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻ ഞാൻ സമ്മറി പഠിച്ച് എനിക്ക് ഒരു എസ് എ എഴുതാൻ പറ്റും എനിക്ക് ഈ പോയോ ഒക്കെ ബൈഹാട്ട് അറിഞ്ഞുകൂടാ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ പല പല ജോണേഴ്സ് പഠിച്ചു പോകാൻ ബുദ്ധിമുട്ടാണ് എന്നാണെങ്കിൽ നോവൽ എടുക്കും അല്ല എനിക്കൊരു ഒരു സാഹിത്യത്തിന്റെ അതിന്റെ അന്തസത്തയോട് കൂടി മനസ്സിലാക്കണം എന്നാണെങ്കിൽ അമേരിക്കൻ ലിറ്ററച്ചർ എടുത്തു കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ കഥയുണ്ട് കവിതയുണ്ട് ചരിത്രമുണ്ട് നാടകമുണ്ട് ചെറുകഥയുണ്ട് നോവലുണ്ട് അപ്പൊ എല്ലാ വശങ്ങളും പഠിക്കാൻ പറ്റും അതുകൊണ്ടാണ് ആ പേപ്പറിന് കുറച്ചും കൂടി പോപ്പുലാരിറ്റി കൂടുന്നത് ഇത് നോവൽ എന്ന് പറയുമ്പോൾ കുറച്ച് നോവലുകൾ മാത്രമേ പഠിക്കുന്നു അതാ വ്യത്യാസം വരുന്നത് ഓക്കെ സർ അത് ആക്ച്വലി ഞാനാണെങ്കിൽ ഇംഗ്ലീഷ് അല്ലായിരുന്നു ഡിഗ്രിക്ക് എടുത്തിരുന്നത് അപ്പൊ കുറച്ചും കൂടെ ടെക്നിക്കൽ ടേംസ് ഒക്കെ വരുന്ന സബ്ജക്ട് എടുത്തു കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ പി ജിക്ക് അല്ല സെക്കൻഡ് ഇയർ കുറച്ചും കൂടെ പെട്ടു എനിക്ക് മനസ്സിലായിട്ട് തിരിച്ചു പോവുക അസൈൻമെന്റ്സിലേക്ക് തിരിച്ചു പോവുക എന്നിട്ട് ആ സിലബസ് എടുത്തിട്ട് നിങ്ങൾക്ക് എത്രത്തോളം അത് കടിച്ചാൽ പൊട്ടും നോക്കുക സിംപ്ലി ഞാൻ ഒന്ന് പറയാൻ പറ്റുമോ വേറൊരു കാര്യം സിലബസ് എടുത്തിട്ട് അതിന്റെ ഒക്കെ മെറ്റീരിയൽസ് വെബിലും എത്ര അവൈലബിൾ ആണെന്ന് നോക്കുക ചില പേപ്പറിലെ മെറ്റീരിയലുകളൊക്കെ വെബിൽ ഒരുപാട് റെഫറൻസുകൾ ഉണ്ടാവില്ല നിങ്ങൾ ഈ വെബ് ഡിപ്പെൻഡന്റ് ആയതുകൊണ്ട് ഗൂഗിൾ ചെയ്യുമ്പോൾ മെറ്റീരിയൽ കിട്ടിയില്ലെങ്കിൽ നിങ്ങൾ തെണ്ടി പോകും ക്ലാസ് കിട്ടാത്തതുകൊണ്ട് പ്രത്യേകിച്ചു അപ്പൊ അങ്ങനത്തെ ഒരു അനാലിസിസും കൂടെ അവിടെ നടത്തുന്നത് നിങ്ങളെ കുറച്ചും കൂടി കംഫർട്ടബിൾ ആക്കും sir one more doubt sir like you you know i like to read a lot uh, sir so uh, like you know i'm still stuck with the first question of my assignment like when do you
on the paper for your exams delve deep into the subject go find resources and keep delving deep, you know diving deep into that especially when you take the case of meg3 almost all those novels have been adapted into movies there are plenty of movies available in youtube or torrent go watch them spend 2 3 hours watching a movie it means 10 papers it will take 30 hours yeah there are movie adaptations of most of these plays go watch that and read the critical things for example in meg3 there is a novel called prime of miss jean broody it tells us how a teacher should not be a teacher who has physical intercourse with her colleagues with her students who who forces her students to sleep with her teachers so the sort of immoral teacher uh, that she is and that leads to her downfall if it was a play that would have become her catharsis yeah so make such observations relish in those findings the theory becomes uh, useful only when you are able to make observations and put it into practice so when you learn theory at one side or when you look at readings critical readings at one side it becomes complete only when you go to the practical aspects of it so relish in those a uh, little findings that you have it may not be a big deal maybe just like she said you watch a movie and you feel that the protagonist is a flat character you remember that the teacher had said that flat character does not undergo a transformation be happy that you have m- made that observation while watching a movie or maybe a, a web series or maybe something else that's all that is required i'm not asking any of you to become lady shakespeare's if you can well and good i'm happy i often say that jennifer has a good writing style she has left it seems she should really try a hand at writing so maybe most of you have various talents because it's online mode i am not able to explore that but maybe you all have writers actors directors a lot of things in you go explore that okay i hope i have answered you nirubama so if that's it we can wind it up if nobody has any further questions it was last day so i am not keeping that time cap it's 25 minutes over time of course in offline classes we do do that sir? yeah yeah uh so for, uh, for me for second year i have decided on meg 5 that is uh, there for yeah. sure then yeah. meg 8 10 mm-hmm. i saw 14 or 16 I'm confused yeah. between fourteen and sixteen because I, I don't know why I love that paper fourteen by looking at all those things. But then, then taking into consideration the technical aspect, because I have a small son too. That is <laughs> I can't read like I used to do in my earlier days. You See, if you can't read, time. there is no point in taking fourteen because fourteen okay. requires you to read extensively. I told you there is an entire book of short story collection, almost two hundred, three hundred pages. the button the yeah. technical part you know like poems and all there are so many things i go i yeah. really go gaga you know, with that paper <laughs> so <laughs> an aspect as you said as you pin point that i just want to finish it off somehow like, you know by that so many things so that technical this now you know how my sensibilities are like i like looking at things in a, with a different perspective critically look at things so something that interest me like rather than you know being forced on me that is what i'm looking forward to so i don't know actually i would still say it's a personal call i don't i can only be suggestive okay sir wow. so yeah. you're leaving me dicey right now also <laughs> <laughs> no guys uh, for those who are asking me in the chat box i'd like to repeat before you opt for a paper go look at the assignment questions given in that paper the choices that you have or the choices do do they do, do, don't have go back to the previous year question papers look at the structure if there are annotations there is a chance that you won't be able to enjoy writing that paper and score much marks so then choose for the better paper do not go by your interest for example meg7 that is indian english literature for me is a paper where people don't score more than 50 because there is annotation there is short note there is essay and people fail to get better marks for that so maybe go for 6 go for eight go for say papers like uh, meg 14 15 16 which are really rich in nature developing in nature modern in nature you can also have a, another pg in those papers translation studies comparative study folk literature gender studies yeah so that's my answer to you vijay 5 6 7 8 i'm not sure about 7 though okay five is a compulsory paper
All right. So shall we call it a day? Nurta namke. How shall we begin? Okay, sir. Okay. So thank, thank you, you all. Thank you, you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you, sir, for your thank help you. and support. Thank you, thank, thank you, sir. Yeah. See you next year. Bye, guys. Stay thank, you, Bye. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Take care. Bye. Wait, wait.